The 47th National Groundwater Association National Convention and Exposition was held in Indianapolis, Indiana, October 28th through the 30th, 1995. One of the highlights of the National Convention is the keynote presentation given by the Darcy Lecturer. The Henry Darcy Distinguished Lecturer Program is sponsored by the Association of Groundwater Scientists and Engineers. The association annually chooses an individual to be offered as a visiting lecturer to a number of universities in North America. This program honors the historical discovery by Henry Darcy in 1856, which established the physical basis on which groundwater hydrology has been worked. Dr. Paul Shea has worked as a hydrologist in the research program of the U.S. Geological Survey and is currently stationed in Menlo Park, California. Dr. Shea received a B.S. in civil engineering from Princeton University and his M.S. and Ph.D. in hydrology from the University of Arizona. Dr. Shea's Darcy Lecture is titled, A Multidisciplinary, Multi-Scale Investigation of Fluid Flow and Solute Transport in Fractured Crystalline Rocks, Findings from Mirror Lake Site, New Hampshire. Uh, the material that I present today is work done by a group of people. Most of us are with the USGS, but we also have collaborations with universities and national labs. So in this regard, I really consider myself a representative of this research team, and the material that I present really consists of work done by this group of people. Um, so let me start. Well, we in terms of outline then, I just want to touch briefly first on what are some of the research issues or the difficulties in fractured rock hydrology. Tell you a little bit about what we're trying to do at this Mirror Lake site. Tell you a little bit about the site and spend most of the time talking about the different types of investigations going on. Uh, we've been trying to do things from a multidisciplinary point of view and also multi-scale, so looking at small volumes of rock and large volumes of rock using a variety of techniques. And then uh, I'll end with some conclusions. Um, by way of contrast, let me start from a different site. I think some of you know about the sand and gravel aquifer that the USGS has also done a lot of research work in uh, near Cape Cod in Massachusetts. What I've plotted here is a distribution of hydraulic conductivity measured in cores. And as you can see, the variation of hydraulic conductivity ranges from about 10 to the minus 4 meters per second, th those are the units that I'll use, to 10 to the minus 3, so about an order of magnitude and variation, typical of a sand and gravel type of aquifer. Uh, this would be considered a relatively homogeneous site. Uh, compared to a fractured rock site such as Mirror Lake, where the hydraulic conductivity is varying over a much larger range. Now, 10 to the minus 10 here is the lowest level that we can measure in a borehole with our equipment. And again, if you're not familiar with these units, 10 to the minus 10 meters per second would be like um, at the upper end of a clay material. So from this lower limit, we see at least six orders of magnitude and variation. Some parts of the rock is very low in permeability, some parts relatively high, and the previous slide that you saw would fit right into here. Okay. So this is an area that uh, we call having strong heterogeneity. And some of the consequences of strong heterogeneity is, is that a lot of the things that we take for granted in a uh, sand and gravel type or sedimentary type of environment become difficult here. For example, it's actually difficult to define the flow system itself. We don't have nice layers that we can use to identify aquifers and aquitards. Uh, properties can drastically change over small distances. I think people have drilled wells in these types of rock, have lots of stories of drilling a well here. You get lots of water, you move 10 meters away, drill another well, you get no water. So under those types of environment, measurements made at one location may not be representative of other locations. You make a number of measurements, it's hard to interpolate or extrapolate, and all of that adds to a relatively high degree of uncertainty. So what we are trying to do at the Mirror Lake site is to develop 
methodologies to work in these kinds of very heterogeneous environments. We want to compare different methods and see how well they work. And right off the bat, we decided we're not going to try just one method, like well tests, uh, but try a variety of methods using a variety of disciplines. And we also want to use a multi-scale approach where we can look at small volumes of rocks and large volumes of rocks to see how the results vary. And finally, it's a place where we like to do some long-term monitoring. OK, the Mirror Lake site is in New Hampshire. Uh, and if you are familiar with New Hampshire, the White Mountains of New Hampshire are over here. And the Mirror Lake site is just at the southern end of the White Mountains. Here's an aerial photograph of the site. Mirror Lake is here. This is Highway I-93 uh, going towards Canada. And basically, uh, the drainage basin right around Mirror Lake is this area here. Uh, there are some streams that drain down into Mirror Lake. This is a hillside here. This open area is one of our well fields. I'll talk about that a little later. There's another well field over here. So we look at a map of the site. It looks something like this. Uh, Mirror Lake is here. This is the drainage basin. I-93 here. One well field over here, another here. Uh, Hubbard Brook is running here. We are within the Hubbard Brook Experimental Forest. This is an area that is run by the US Forest Service devoted to ecosystems and forest hydrology research. So lots of uh, studies have been done in this area. Now we are interested in the subsurface. So just to give you an idea of the subsurface, let me just draw a cross section from A here down the hillside to the well field, over to Mirror Lake, and then over to Hubbard Brook. And what we see is a fairly typical New England kind of uh, uh, setup where we have a hillside here, a river valley, a low-lying area here. The bedrock is granite and schist, and overlying the bedrock is a layer of glacial deposit. It's about 10 meters down here in the lower elevation, and it thins out as we go up the hillside. So that's the general setup. Here's a look at the bedrock. This is an outcrop on Highway I-93. Um, the darker rock is the schist. The lighter rock is the granitic intrusion. And you can see fractures, long-going ones, shorter ones, uh, a fairly complicated pattern here. Here's a closer look at the rock. This is granite here, schist over here, uh, pegmatite dike. And you'd expect that the rock itself is fairly low in hydraulic conductivity, and most of the water is going to move through fractures in these rocks. Those are the features we want to study. OK, before going to different types of studies, let me uh, just give you a brief idea of the scales that we are working with. We think of these studies in three scales, small, medium, and large. At the small scale, uh, we are looking at individual wells that have been drilled in this area. There are wells drilled within this watershed. There are some drilled outside also. In these wells, we want to characterize the rock, the fractures, from each individual well. So we think of these as small scale studies because from a well, when you do a test, you're characterizing a small volume of rock around the well, typically several meters. So those are our small scale studies. Now the problem with these small scale studies is that it's hard to figure out how fractures are connected over larger distances in space. So we set up two well fields. There's one over here, and there's another one over here. These well fields are about 100 meters by 100 meters. And we drill a network of wells in these well fields, um, ranging from 10 to 30 meters apart. And we can do tests and geophysics between wells to try to determine how fractures are connected over larger distances. So that would be our medium scale study, or well field scale, about 100 meters. Finally, the entire drainage basin of catchment is the, our large scale study. Here you can think of water, uh, rain coming down, soaking into the ground and moving through the glacial drift or the bedrock, and then discharging into either these streams or into Mirror Lake. So we're talking about flow distances of up to one kilometer. So that, for us, would be our large scale study. And one of the things that we're interested in is how do results of small scale studies compare with the medium scale, scale studies and the large scale studies. So let's start with our small scale studies. Here I'll just uh, list uh, a few of the different methodologies that we've been using in single wells. 
So first, we drill our wells. We do a number of geophysical uh, logging, both standard and specialized ones, especially to image the fractures in the rock. Uh, we sample the water for geochemical analysis, and then we do a number of hydraulic tests to determine the hydraulic properties of the fractures. Now, all our wells are drilled by standard water well drilling techniques. Uh, we use air hammer drilling. Um, the wells are six inches. They're cased over the glacial drift, and then it's an open hole uh, down to anywhere from 100 to 300 meters. And after we drill our wells, the first thing that we do would be uh, the geophysical logging. This is the logging truck out of Denver uh, under Fred Pillay's project. Uh, we do a number of geophysical logs. Now, the, probably the, uh, the most useful one for detecting fracture uh, is the acoustic televiewer log. I think this is going to be a fairly standard log in uh, fracture ro rock work now. Uh, basically, what the tool does is it shoots an acoustic beam against the side of the well and then measure the reflection. If the beam hits a solid part of the well, then you get a high reflection. If the beam hits a fracture, the, the beam gets scattered, you get a low reflection. And what this log does is it creates an image of where the fractures are, and the image is basically, uh, you can think of this as a panorama of the inside of the well uh, cut along north. Uh, so if a fracture intersects a well at an angle, we see a sine wave like this. So this is what a typical set of logs look like. These are just photographs. Uh, and you see a fracture here, some more fracture here, a bunch more fractures here. And we just uh, use this way to determine where the fractures are in the well because most of our wells are not cored. We do have a number of wells that are cored, but coring is so much more expensive that we've decided to drill more wells instead uh, using percussion drilling. Now, uh, if we want to look at the rock, we can send a video camera down the well. This is a standard borehole video camera. Uh, here's the lens looking down the well with a light source. You can get a picture that looks somewhat like this. This is not a very good quality uh, picture because it's taken right off the television monitor. But basically, you're looking down the well. Here's the light source. The well is illuminated. You can see a fracture here. It's somewhat broken here. And very often, when we drill through a fracture, uh, the sides gets broken up. Now, uh, this would be the standard way, but technology is always improving. And uh, recently, we were able to get some um, high-resolution digital uh, pictures of the well, uh, which looked something like this. So now, again, here you can think of this as a panorama of the inside of the well, uh, starting from south in this particular case. Here's a fracture here. Here's a fracture here. Uh, and in these pictures, you can actually see some of the uh, more detailed uh, foliation of the rock. And uh, again, in a, on the uh, computer monitor, you can actually see um, individual crystals. And, and so the resolution is quite good. You can actually take this picture, roll it back up, and produce what I would call a virtual core. This would be the core that you would have gotten, uh, created from the image of the well. Um, and here's a fracture here. Very often, it's w a little bit weathered on both sides of the fracture. And then you have unweathered rock on both sides. So the ability to get an image of the well is actually uh, pretty good these days. Now, what we want to do is to find out how much water is moving through these fractures. So a uh, quick way to do that is to do what we call a borehole flow survey. The idea is very simple. Uh, lots of people are starting to use this method. Uh, basically, here's a borehole. These white lines are fractures, and the ones that are in blue are fractures that transmit water. We put a pump in the well, we pump at a constant rate, and we use a flow meter to measure the flow rate in the well. The idea being that uh, below the lowest water transmissive fracture, the water down here is stagnant, so you get no velocity. And as you move your flow meter up, when you go past a fracture that's springing in water, uh, you get an increase in velocity because water is coming in, flowing up the well into the pump. If you go past fractures that don't yield water, say if these fractures are closed or sealed, you don't see this increase in velocity. And then uh, for fairly quickly, within several hours, you can do this in a well that's, say, 100 meters and identify where the fractures are that are yielding water by where you have increase in flow. So that's a fairly quick way to get a quick view of which are the water transmissive fractures and which, which are not. Now, we also do packer tests. 
uh, packers or instruments that we can use to uh, block off a portion of the well. And then we can either inject water or pump water uh, out uh, and measure the flow rate and the change in pressure and determine a hydraulic conductivity of this section of the well. We typically use five meter sections and by moving this up and down the well, we can determine a hydraulic conductivity distribution along the well. Uh, here's Alan Shapiro with a uh, set of packers. Uh, the slide is uh, somewhat uh, uh, washed out here, but basically here's the lower packer, here's the upper packer. The packer, the main part of the packer is a rubber sheath that can be inflated with compressed air. They seal against the side of the well and you have isolated a section here. Now this particular section is not five meters, but is just for illustration here. And you can either take water out for sampling or do testing. Okay, well we've done lots of these tests. We have close to 50 wells at this site. We've done several hundreds of these tests and we see something that's very similar from well to well and uh, this is one particular example that shows what we see. So in this particular well, it's cased down to about 30 meters and it's open hole from 30 down to about 85 meters, so about 50 meters of open hole. And on the average in 50 meters, we would see anything from maybe 20 to 60 fractures. So on the average, we're talking about a fracture every meter or every two meters. But as you can see, the fractures tend to be uh, clustered together. There are sections of the well that are are not uh, fractured at all. This is the acoustic televiewer log. And if we take five meter intervals and measure the hydraulic conductivity, uh, what we find is that most of these uh, five meter intervals have a fairly low hydraulic conductivity, somewhere between 10 to the minus nine to 10 to the minus seven meters per second. Um, again, if you want to think of a sedimentary material, that would be something like a silty material. Okay. So most of the portions of the rock are um, like hydraulically a silty material. But then here and there we en encounter fractures that are much more transmissive. Right here and right here, uh, these fractures are two to three orders of magnitude more transmissive than the rest of these fractures. And the obvious question is what's happening here? Are these fractures connected over a large distance so that if a contaminant gets in, uh, the contaminant would move very quickly over large distances? Or are these local features that are not connected over large distances? Now, when we're looking at an individual well, we can't really answer that question. So obviously we need to go up to a larger scale to see how things are connected over larger distances. But before we do that, let me just uh, summarize the results of our, of our uh, small scale test, or these five meter packer tests. And I'll use this slide. And in this graph, uh, it's divided into three panels. Uh, in this panel here, I'll put the small scale measurements that I've just presented. And then uh, later, we'll put in the medium scale and the well field measurements and the large scale results over in these uh, two other panels for comparison. So on the small scale then, uh, we see hydraulic conductivities that are very high, some portions very tight. Uh, we see the whole range of, of variation. So basically, the what happens when you look at things in small scale is that you see lots of variation. That's really the finding uh, from these meter scale investigations. Large variations, large variations in fracture spacing, in hydraulic conductivity, ranging at least six orders of magnitude. And then this observation that although we see lots of fractures in a well, uh, there are a few, two, three, four, or five in each well that are significantly more transmissive than the rest. So the question is, how are these fractures connected over larger distances in space? And so to do that, we'll go to our next scale, our medium scale study. These would be our 100 meter scale investigations. Here we are working in well fields. Uh, I'm just going to talk about the FSE well field because we've done most of our work there. We're using cross hole geophysics, uh, multiple well hydraulic tests, and tracer tests, which I actually won't have time to talk about in these well fields to try to determine how these fractures are connected over larger distances in space. Okay, here's a picture of one of the well fields. Uh, there's a well here uh, and here. There's some behind this tree. Uh, you probably can't see it very well um, in this slide, but let me just skip forward to the uh, map of the well locations. So at this time, this well field has 13 wells. 
Uh, the distance from this well one to well six is about 120 meters. Going across is about 80 meters. And all these wells are at least 80 meters deep. Some are deeper. So you can think of uh, this well field as a place where we're trying to characterize a block of rock uh, about 100 meters on a side like this. And if we want to visualize this block of rock, it would look something like this. So here's the land surface. This uh, plane here is 80 meters below land surface, and these are the wells, and this is this block of rock. Actually, there's a layer of glacial drift uh, overlying the rock itself. Now, if we take each of these wells and divide uh, each well into a five meter section and measure the hydraulic conductivity, we find something very similar to what we see in all the rest of the wells. That is, each well uh, intersects lots of fractures, but in each well, there are just several places where the fractures are much more conductive than the rest of the fractures. If we identify these locations, uh, they are like they are shown uh, as in this slide. So where the yellow dots are, are locations where we have uh, significantly more transmissive fractures. So for example, if we look at this well, uh, there are lots of fractures, but right here and right here, the fractures are much more transmissive. So the question is, how are these dots connected? Uh, if we look at this picture, we might expect that, well, this might be part of a fracture zone, but then how is this zone connected to these or to these points here? And what we did basically was to do a lot of geophysics from well to well, uh, to do a lot of, we did a lot of hydraulic tests and tracer tests. And what I'll do is actually tell you what the answer is first and then tell you how we got there because that's a little easier for me to explain. So if we try now to connect the dots, uh, the picture that we can get is something like this. Now what I've shown here is, here's the block of rock again. There are these colored regions or patches. And these are the locations where we have uh, regions of higher hydraulic conductivity or higher, um, more transmissive fractures connected together to form one of these regions. So each of this, these regions is not a single fracture, but made up of high uh, transmissivity fractures connected with one another over distances of, this is about 30 meters, this would be about 60 meters. Now these fractures are then uh, embedded uh, in a background network of less permeable fractures that are not shown here. To give you another uh, picture of, uh, of this subsurface, let me just draw a cross section um, right down the middle of this well field and, and give you another perspective. So here's the cross section. Um, here's the glacial drift, the bedrock is here, in the bedrock there are lots of fractures. But what we find is that there are locations where the fractures are much more transmissive. They connect together to form these zones that are highlighted in the four different colors. Each of these zones are then a cluster of high transmissivity fractures. And what we find in this rock is four of these regions. Now how did we find these regions? One way to do that is by crosshole geophysics. Uh, we've been using both seismic and electromagnetic tomography methods. I'll just talk about the seismic. The idea is very simple. We have a source uh, of seismic waves, or basically a sound wave in one well. And in another well, we have a string of receivers. And what we want to do is to measure how fast the seismic wave travels through the rock from the source to the receiver. The idea is if you have a rock that's solid, uh, if the fractures are small, the sound wave will travel very quickly across. Uh, if you have a big open fracture here, uh, the sound wave will be slowed down and then uh, you, it'll take a longer time. And by moving the source up and down and the receivers up and down, uh, what we can do is uh, do a cross coverage of travel time measurements from here to here all the way down to here, and you get this cross coverage. And then by a inversion algorithm, we can determine the velocity distribution in this cross section. So locations where the velocity is high uh, would be locations where the rock is less fractured or the fractures are smaller, and locations where we have a low velocity would be locations where the rock is more fractured. Here is my colleague Earl Green. Earl is holding the seismic source. This is instruments developed by Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory. Um, they worked with us over several summers to do this work. Now the source is basically a stack of piezoelectric crystals. It's shocked by 10,000 volts. This makes a ping. The ping travels through the rock, uh, gets detected by uh, these sensors. This is a six inch well cap, so it's a fairly small device. And then we met by that way we measure the travel time. 
uh, to, I'll just give you one example of uh, one of these uh, results. And to do that, I've taken away some of these wells and some of these other um, zones so uh, you can see where this cross section is. So we have a source in one well, a receiver in another well, and here's the cross section. And when we've done the analysis, what we find is that we can see the edge of one of these high permeability zones. Uh, these, this zone um, uh, pen, uh, uh, intersects this cross section on this edge only and doesn't extend across to this other side. Uh, near the bottom of, the, uh, of this cross section, there's another zone of high permeability or, or more transmissive fractures, and this zone actually cross connect from one well to the, to the other. Okay, here's what a tomogram looks like. This slide is actually reversed so that the direction of view is similar to uh, the previous slide. So basically, the regions where uh, the color is red would be the high seismic velocity regions. So those would be regions where we think the rock is less fractured or the fractures are smaller. The darker regions are low velocity, so these would be regions where the rock is more broken up. When we look at this cross section between this well here and this other well, which is not quite straight, what we find is a low seismic velocity zone right near the top of the bedrock. So we, we would interpret this as a zone of more broken up rock, and that's probably due to uh, weathering near the top of the bedrock. We see this zone in just about every uh, cross section. Now when we go further down, we see the edge of one of these high permeability zones. Uh, if we go to the next cross section, there's another well over here and do uh, another tomogram. We actually see this zone extending out this way, but this zone only partially extends into this cross section. We don't find it here. Near the bottom of this cross section, the coverage is a little poorer, uh, and we see another high permeability zone. Uh, this zone actually cross connect from one side of the well to the other side. So by doing uh, these pairs of wells making cross-sections uh, tomograms. We've done about 20 of these. Uh, we can put them together and try to identify where these high permeability zones are. Now in other wells, if these wells penetrate more than one of these high permeability zones, we'll put another packer here so that uh, uh, water won't flow into the well and then flow along the well into another high permeability zone. If you don't put a packer in there, you basically get a short circuit. Um, so there's the packer here and there's a packer here. Now, if this were a nice layer of sandstone or uh, sand and gravel, what you expect when you pump from this well is that you have fairly large drawdown close to the well, and as you go farther and further away, you get lo less and less drawdown. In a fractured rock with these high permeability zones, you see something very different. What you see is that locations that are connected by one of these high permeability zones all have the same response. So when you pump here, uh, a distance is, let's say, about 50 meters away, we see a response. This same response is seen at over here, which is maybe 110 meters away. So distance is not so much a factor in controlling the drawdown as where these zones are and what wells they connect. Uh, in the next slide, I'll just show you a, a sample of drawdown data, and the data are color-coded so that uh, drawdowns here and here are in yellow, in red here, green here, and blue here. And basically, what we see uh, is that the similar color data just plot right on top of each other. So all the yellow data pl plot on top of each other, the red ones, the blue ones pretty close. And then this particular one here is the pump well itself. It has a response of its own uh, because water is converging into that well. Now with this type of response, we can't really analyze these response by a standard well test analysis technique because uh, the standard techniques typically assume a, a homogeneous layer of rock, whereas here we have these high and low permeability zones. So what we decided to do is just use a numerical model. We'll build a computer model. We'll put in these high and low permeability zones. And what we just decided to do is to use a standard groundwater model. We use mod flow, so we're doing continuum modeling. Uh, and we divide the model into zones of different hydraulic conductivities. Uh, locations where we have these highly conductive fracture clusters uh, will represent those locations by cells with high